Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Uh, we have actually a really amazing subject, something I've, I've wanted to speak about for a long time. I actually looked up just a minute ago exactly how to pronounce his name, because I've been saying it in a certain way for a long time, and I realized, oh my gosh, I don't want to blow it, by, blow it by pronouncing it wrong for an entire 50 minutes. So I would guess the subject of tonight's lecture is Samuel Usque. However, when I looked it up online, they said Usque which seemed to me not in conformity with Latin rules of pronunciation, but on the other hand, the name is Portuguese. So please, those of you who know how to pronounce this properly, forgive me if I say usque, it's gonna come naturally. But at any rate, I, I don't mean by this kind of lighthearted introduction to demean, diminish in any way the tremendous heroism of this individual that we're speaking about today. It amazes me that so few people are familiar with his work. He is one of those tremendous heroes of the Jewish literary tradition, uh, literally risking his life to put certain words to paper, uh, and the the book that he ultimately completed that we'll be looking at tonight was in fact a treasured possession of many a converso family, many Sephard in particular uh, from Portugal uh, actually gave up their lives for possessing this particular book. Uh, I believe that tonight you will be transformed by the story of Samuel Usque and his book, The Constellations for the Tribulations of Israel. An absolutely amazing uh, phenomenon that I look forward to discussing with you over the next 40 minutes or so. So let us begin with our usual thank yous. Uh, tonight's lecture is sponsored by Mr. Brandon Sultan in honor of the Sultan and Benarok families. I'll just read what it says here. Whose Sephardic roots are expressed in a desire to honor the convivencia. That's what we discussed last semester, right? The, the coexistence of Muslims, Jews, and Christians for that brief period of time. In, um, in early Al-Andalus, and also in loving memory of Mrs. Jean Milstein, whose relentless optimism was an inspiration to us all. I also have to make a good and so thank you to Mr. Sultan, who is a regular viewer of these lectures online. Uh, I have to make a quick announcement. Remember, next week is President's Day, so uh, we will not have our conventional class on Monday night, but uh, gear up because the following week we'll be studying the Chida, uh, Rabbi Azulai, one of the most important figures of the 18th century who uh, was really a, uh, a transformative figure in creating the identity of Sephardic Jews by uniting them around the entire Mediterranean basin. Absolutely fascinating figure, uh, very, very prolific and active in um, all kinds of Jewish affairs. We are also short, unfortunately, a sponsor for next week. So if anyone would care to donate to our student scholarship fund, uh, we ask for $250 to make these lectures possible. And the money goes entirely 100% to our students to help them pay the uh, sometimes difficult tuition bill because college is expensive and in order to make this work, we try to help them out in every way possible. You can uh, sponsor by visiting this website, bit.ly at the Friends of Jewish History. Much appreciated. Of course, I'm always grateful for your presence here. That gives me a tremendous amount of chizuk and makes me feel like it's worth doing the research for these lectures every week. Uh, tonight's lecture is gonna rely almost exclusively, certainly very heavily, on the research of Dr. Martin A. Cohen, uh, who uh, translated and wrote a critical edition of this Portuguese work that is the core of our subject tonight. Uh, Portuguese is just not one of those languages that is well studied in Judaic studies as a whole. Obviously, the Brazilian community is much more familiar with it, but in Europe, um, and in Israel, Portuguese is lower down in the languages that we go to. Nevertheless, we have essentially a Shakespearean work, something of, of that great status in Portuguese literature authored by the, the uh, Jewish individual that we'll discuss tonight, Samuel Usque, and uh, we're deeply grateful to Dr. Cohen for his pioneering research in many areas of Sephardic studies. We'll be returning to his research when we look at conversos and crypto-Jews here in the Americas, uh, where he's done quite a bit of research as well. So that's kudos to Dr. Cohen. Let us now go right to the topic at hand. What exactly are we talking about? We're going to focus on this book here, which is truly a most dangerous book. 
It was a book which was banned early on by the Inquisition and consigned to the flames in 1553, but it was ultimately a book that uh, transformed the lives of so many Jews who had felt that all hopes were dashed, that everything that for a millennium and a half of exile the Jews had worked for was for naught, and it uh, strengthened their spirits and allowed them to continue to maintain their identity as best as possible under unimaginable conditions. Specifically, the title of the book is, as you see here in Portuguese, translated into English, Consolations for the Tribulations of Israel. Uh, it was published in Ferrara, Italy in 1553. I've discussed uh, Ferrara a little bit last week when we looked at the life of Benvenida Abravanel. This was produced through her sponsorship and also that of her rival, Gracia Mendez. We'll return to those two very important women to understand how they related to this particular book. And it was also authored and printed in a period when printing was still fairly rare. That this is the, uh, the heyday of early printing, the discovery of this new technology that allowed for wide dissemination of text. It meant that official organizations such as the church had to find ways to control the dissemination of often heretical or at least antinomian uh, works and to make sure that certain ideas did not circulate too far. Of course, some of them, such as uh, Luther's translation of the Bible circulated very far and had a tremendously negative impact on the Catholic Church. This is the period of time when uh, 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 Usque came out with this particular work. You can see that the uh, the frontispiece has this image of the globe, which is meant to evoke the scattering of the Portuguese Jews in particular um, after the Spanish Inquisition and the Portuguese expulsion. We'll discuss those in details. And the, uh, the kind of uh, the, uh, the banner around here says, um, you know, I, my hope I place in God. Um, and uh, the, the, you can see that the, the wackiness of the early printing is such that they not only say the year, but they even publish the date, the 7th of September, that it was published. Like somehow, maybe it was Erev Yom Kippur or something, I don't know. But it's like you put this specific date that is published there. Now, just to give you a sense of what this book meant, we can look at some of the Inquisition trial records, of which we have copious uh, numbers. Ironically, and this is a theme that we've come back to many times, really, since the, the fall semester, there are uncanny parallels between the Spanish Inquisition and expulsion and the Holocaust of the last century. So many parallels in terms of social developments, in terms of how uh, governing authorities dealt with the challenges of a changing society and so on. And in one of those areas, we see again that just like the Nazis, Yamach Shaman Vizichram, kept such incredibly detailed records. And they were very, very particular about what exactly happened when, to whom, and who would manage it, and so on. The Inquisition also had very, very detailed records. And so scholars who wish to understand the mechanics of destruction of that 14th and 15th century have a tremendous amount of material to work with. So specifically, uh, there was a Portuguese Jew named Thomas Fernandes. Most Jews took Christian names when they were baptized. He was certainly not a new Converso. He was probably several generations into uh, Christian identity, but of course they had retained their, their attachment to Judaism nevertheless. He was arrested in Lisbon in 1558, and he was tried for quite some time before he was eventually sent to the flames. Specifically, he was tried for crimes that he had allegedly committed, that is, crimes against the faith, while he was in Bristol, England. You'll recall, by the way, I have to do a very quick review for those who I see a few new faces here. Welcome. Uh, some of the audience members here are kind of rambunctious, but you'll see that we have a pretty good time, I think, by the end of the hour. Um, you'll recall, just very briefly, that the Spanish Inquisition, which later spread to Portugal, was not, technically speaking, directed at Jews. It was directed at Jews who had been baptized, forcibly or for social mobility, for whatever reason it was. This is referring to new Christians, so-called new Christians, that is, they were Jewish, but had been converted. 
who were not adhering to the tenets of Roman Catholicism. And so the Inquisition was trying to root out those new Christians or their children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren who were not abiding by the tenets of Catholicism. Uh, later, in, in 1492, the Spaniards expelled all the Jews, as opposed to the new Christians who were allowed to stay, but they expelled the Jews because the, um, they were suspected, correctly, of continuing to maintain contact with the so-called new Christians and to be a center of, of authority and education and religious practice to these forcibly converted Jews who are now Christians. So the Inquisition is directed technically at Christians who are suspected of harboring Jewish beliefs. The expulsion was directed at Jews per se. Hence you have this distinction in terminology, the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, because uh, many of those Jews who were called Spanish were in fact Jewish and expelled. Many of the Jews who were called Portuguese were in fact forcibly converted, as we shall see shortly. At any rate, in the trial, the Inquisition trial in the 16th century of Thomas Fernandez, we have this interesting passage in which he writes that uh, when he was living in Bristol, there was another new Christian named Simon, that should be Simeon Roiz, uh, who lived in London, uh, and uh, Fernandez had also had already under torture given up this name, so he was speaking about all of his associates in the context of the Inquisition trial, and that this, this other individual, Dr. Roiz, had given Mr. Fernandez, a book of prophecies, a printed book of prophecies. The notice that the word here has to be included, printed, because this is opposed to handwritten book. And what was this book about? It spoke of the troubles which the sons of Isaac suffered and said that they must not lose confidence nor be discouraged because God would send the Messiah. And this is undoubtedly a version of this book that we hold here straight from the amazing Avenue J Library downstairs. Um, there are a few errors in here, like for example, it says it was dedicated to Beatriz de Luna. Uh, oh no, this is correct, I'm sorry. Beatriz de Luna, the wife of Diego Mendez. Those are the Christian names of uh, Gracia Mendez, uh, Dona Gracia. We'll read the dedication shortly. It was written in Portuguese. It was a quarto that refers to the size of the volume. And as this was a burden on his conscience, meaning the uh, person who was uh, being tortured to confess here, he asked pardon of our Lord Jesus Christ, he asked for penance, uh, and the inquisitors ultimately accept his penance, and in order to ensure his safe passage of the world to come, they accelerate it with the fires of the auto da fe. But clearly this is a reference to the underground circulation of this book among new Christians. And we know from many trials that it circulated both in manuscript copy and in printed copy. And it was painstakingly written out in full from one family and handed to another in order to purvey the message that it contained. A message of hope, a message of consolation, a message of chizuk, of strengthening for the Jewish people. Now, it tends to drop away from Jewish consciousness after the 16th century for several reasons. One is, as I mentioned, it's written in Portuguese. It was never translated uh, until the 20th century. Portuguese Jews did have some familiarity with Spanish, and in fact, the author himself writes uh, that he could have chosen Spanish as a language to convey his message, but he felt he really wanted to reach the most desperate of those Jews, those ones who were living in that liminal space between being fully Jewish, between being fully Christian. Uh, he chose Portuguese specifically, so that limited it to some degree. Uh, it could be that the reason why it fell out of circulation is because in 1553, almost immediately after it was printed, uh, the papacy uh, instituted a mass book burning of Jewish texts, and it probably got caught up quite a bit in that first uh, major uh, book burning of the 16th century. And also, it may speak to the tremendous secrecy with which the Converso community guarded this treasured book that uh, we only know about it primarily from what the inquisitors have to say. Uh, it does make some impact on the literary tradition, but unfortunately uh, many other tribulations rose up shortly thereafter and it tends to get lost. Let us though now look to the history of the Jews of Portugal to try to place Usque's specific work within that context. So you'll recall 
Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the, there was forced conversions in Spain that goes really back to the 14th century, in which some over-enthusiastic lower clergy in particular, acting in many times against the will of the papacy and the higher clergy, converted tens of thousands of Jews to Christianity. And those Jews who were baptized were suddenly trapped because the Catholic Church does not recognize the institution of forced conversion, at least not in the 14th century. In other words, if a person was baptized, even against their will, they were nevertheless uh, Christian. As, as I think we mentioned last semester, we talked about the terrible case of Edgar Mortara, who was already in the 19th century, was kidnapped by the church because the maid in his home thinking that he, as an infant, was going to die of scarlet fever or something like that. She had him baptized because she worried about his eternal soul. And when the uh, papacy found out, they actually kidnapped him and never returned him. He grew up as a priest and uh, engaged even in, in proselytizing with Jews. Steven Spielberg is coming out with a major motion picture about the Mortara affair, which is certain to be a blockbuster. At any rate, you've got in Spain now this massive population of Jews who are, who are forcibly converted, who now have free reign in the economy and society of Spain because they're no longer held captive by the restrictions that were associated with their prior Jewish identity. This was very upsetting to the social, political, and economic order, uh, and especially because many of these Jews continued with their traditional Jewish practice and associations, marrying with other new Christian families, sometimes even with Jewish families, and sometimes you would have uh, marriages at, into old Christian families. It was highly destabilizing. So the uh, Ferdinand and Isabella brought in the Inquisition to control that movement, and ultimately in 1492 they decided that's it, we're going to get rid of the Jews, and hopefully that will solve the problem, because now these conversos will have no one to whom to turn. Uh, they were very wrong. Ultimately, of the Jews who were expelled, many of them fled to neighboring Portugal here on the coast. Um, now, in Portugal, uh, there's an exceptionally sad story of how they were treated. There was a kind of a, a, a oscillation between incredible cruelty and liberalism, which at times assuaged the fears of the, the, this emigre community that in fact they would be allowed to live safely in Portugal, and in other times crushed those hopes in their infancy with tremendous brutality. We look at... Um, now, I would like to say my favorite king, but that's only because I like his name. And I know I mispronounced everything. It's João, right? Olivia, is that how you say it? João. But I like saying it João, <laughs> though it's not right. But anyway, this is João II, who uh, in 1492 admitted the Jews and said, listen, I see there's thousands of you pouring across my border. Um, you're all very wealthy. The Jews are known as being the leaven of the economy. So you can come in here, you can bring your wealth, you can pay a special tax, and you can live here for eight months until you sort yourselves out, until you figure out where you're going to live. Uh, and in the meantime, once he realized how valuable this new immigrant community was, he said, you know, we should really keep the Jews here, but rather than uh, simply open up his borders and give them free reign, he figured it would be much easier if they came and stayed, but as Christians. So he exposed them to many forced conversionist sermons, which were de rigueur and very popular since the 13th century in Spain um, after the, uh, the Barcelona dispute with Nachmanides. Uh, and uh, his successor was especially cruel. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was also, uh, I'm sorry, the II. He figured that one of the ways we're going to get the Jews to convert is actually if we work through their children. After months and months of conversion of sermons with very little success, he actually took perhaps some, several thousand children and separated them from their parents and sent them to the newly discovered island of Sao Tome, which is here off the coast of West Africa, uh, with the, uh, this, uh, the explicit statement that uh, they would then be, um, uh, they would be returned to their parents once their parents converted to Christianity. So uh, that particular episode is recorded in uh, Usque's book, I'd like to read it to you very quickly just to get a sense of his style and something which 
um, was immediately prior to his own birth. Um, to my misfortune, he puts it in the present ten in the uh, first person singular uh, because the narrator is none other than Jacob the patriarch. Uh, who describes in a kind of symbolic way all of the suffering of the Jews throughout time. So he writes, To my misfortune, the island of Sao Tome had recently been discovered. It was inhabited by lizards, snakes, and other venomous reptiles, and was devoid of rational beings. Uh, they used it, for example, to uh, house a slave fortress for the um, burgeoning transatlantic slave trade that would uh, dominate the region. Here the king exiled condemned criminals, and he decided to include among them the innocent children of these Jews. Their parents had seemingly been condemned by God's sentence. When the luckless hour arrived for this barbarity to be inflicted, mothers scratched their faces in grief as their babies, less than three years old, were taken from their arms. Honored elders tore their beards when the fruit of their bodies was snatched before their eyes. The faded children raised their piercing cries to heaven as they were mercilessly torn from their beloved parents at such a tender age. Several women threw themselves at the king's feet, begging for permission to accompany their children, but not even this moved the king's pity. One mother, distraught by this horrible, unexampled cruelty, lifted her baby in her arms and, paying no heed to its cries, threw herself from the ship into the heaving sea and drowned, embracing her only child. Thus, those innocent souls were removed from their parents' sweet tenderness by such inhumanities and delivered into the power of merciless enemies. O oh, brothers, who could describe to you the hidden and visible anguish which cloaked all my children, the sighs, the tears, the bloody and febrile groans which were heard in all their houses? For there are no words of consolation to relieve a pain so great, even though each one had good reason to hope for consolation." He goes on to say that when these innocent children arrived at the wilderness of Sao Tome, which was to be their grave, they were thrown ashore and mercilessly left there. Almost all were swallowed up by the huge lizards on the island, and the remainder who escaped these reptiles wasted away from hunger and abandonment. Only a few were miraculously spared that dreadful misfortune. Absolutely horrific, unimaginable kind of persecutions that were meted out to the Jews in an attempt to bring them into Portuguese society as Christians. But unfortunately, it gets worse. So this is a picture of his successor, uh, Manuel I. Manuel I, the king, wanted to create a dynastic union with uh, Spain, uh, creating one Christian dominion for the entire peninsula. And so in order to affect this, he in, uh, agreed to take the daughter of Queen Isabella, the Infanta Isabella, as uh, his wife, creating a dynastic union. Um, Isabella and Ferdinand, very doctrinaire, anti-Judaic individuals, uh, insisted that they would not form a union with a country that still permitted Jews in its midst. So Manuel agreed to expel all the Jews uh, in 1497 in a manner similar to the Spanish expulsion of 1492. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, not Isabella's daughter. This is his uh, second wife, Maria. Isabella died in childbirth, and so he then married her sister in order to uh, preserve the uh, union. Uh, the, the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal, or the agreement to expel them, ironically is, as the historian Prescott put it, uh, the first time that Jews were persecuted out of love. Ironic, right? Because he loved, you know, it's not really funny. I don't know why I said it. Maybe I'll just cut that out of the internet because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, we're talking about the lizards. Now we're talking about, oh, forget it. Okay, so um, what did he do? So he decided, I'm going to expel all the Jews, but then he realized, you know what? Once again, like his predecessor, the Jews are very valuable. So instead, you know what? Let's just baptize them all instead. Let's just make them Christian. That way we'll keep their wealth, we'll keep their know-how. It's only a few thousand Jews anyways. Uh, and so through various stratagems, he actually brought them to the seaside. And before boarding boats, they were uh, baptized. And suddenly they became Christians. No more Jewish problem in Portugal. And then immediately thereafter, he closed the borders. 
and he said that no new Christians may leave Portugal. So one of these ironic situations in which the Jews are not free to practice their religion, they are free to be Christians, and they're not free to leave either. They must remain within the boundaries of Portugal with their wealth and their economic know-how and so on. So for the next several decades, Portuguese Jews are trying desperately to kind of uh, s uh, escape Portugal and find a place where they can practice Judaism freely. In Amsterdam, Salonika, Constantinople, places like that, Sfat, these are places where the Portuguese Jews, who were only a few years earlier Spanish Jews, are now trying to find ways to live their life uh, freely as Jews. But they're terribly afraid, with good reason, that if they are discovered trying to leave, then they will be subject to tremendous persecution. Mob violence uh, dominates the Jewish experience in Portugal over the next couple of decades. In 1503, again, so this is 1497 when they have been forcibly baptized. Uh, technically expelled, but then forcibly baptized to stay in Portugal. 1503, there's a famine, and the Jews are, of course, blamed for the famine, and there's mob violence. That is not Jews. These are the conversos, right? The Jews who have been converted to Christianity, their presence is viewed as the reason for the famine. Uh, there's hyperinflation a few years later, and once again, the Jews are blamed for the hyperinflation. In 1506 is an especially terrible moment when... Um, there's a, uh, someone in church in, I believe it was Lisbon, right, it is in Lisbon, on Easter Sunday, remarked that an icon of the Virgin Mary was glowing with a supernatural light, and one of these new Christians, uh, a baptized Jew, says, it's just the reflection of a candle. And the suggestion that, the, uh, that it was a natural phenomenon created a horrible massacre in Lisbon in which uh, even lay clergy also participated. Uh, and we can list several of these kinds of like mob reactions because the general population is not happy with the introduction of these new economic competitors who now as Christians, even though everybody knows they're not really enthusiastic Christians, are beginning to dominate the, uh, the economic echelon society. There is a little bit of a liberalization under the III uh, in 1521, uh, but then there's a series of more uh, pogroms, really, after uh, there's a crop failure and several other things that go wrong. In 1531, things reach a climax when there's an earthquake, and so Huao III says, that's it, we're bringing in the Inquisition again, the dreaded Inquisition, which was, uh, of course, scourged uh, Spain. And at this point, I would like to read once again from Usque's work in which he describes the Inquisition in terrifying and strangely modern terms. When I first read this, it felt to me a lot like Franz Kafka. Uh, and, the, and in fact, in many ways, the Portuguese Inquisition was rather Kafka-esque. If you've read The Trial in particular, or The Harrow, you'll recognize some of the elements. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised even if Kafka was influenced by it. Um, where is it here? Right here it is. The king and queen sent to Rome for a wild monster, right? The Inquisition comes from Rome, Roman Catholic, of such strange form and horrible mien that all Europe trembles at the mere mention of its name. He speaks of the Inquisition in uh, concrete and metaphorical terms. Its body an amalgam of hard iron and deadly poison, has an adamantine shell made of steel and covered with enormous scales. It rises in the air on a thousand wings with black and poisonous pinions, and it moves on the ground with a thousand pernicious and destructive feet. Its form is like both the awesome lions and the frightful serpents in the deserts of Africa. Its enormous teeth equal those of the most powerful elephants. Its whistle or voice kills even more quickly than the venomous basilisk. Its eyes and mouth spew continual flames and blazes of consuming fire. And the food it eats is the fire in which human bodies burn. Its flight is swifter than the eagle's, but wherever it passes, its shadow spreads a pall of gloom over the brightest sun. 
Finally, in its wake, it leaves a darkness, like the darkness visited upon Egyptians in one of the plagues. And when it arrives at its destination, the green grass which it treads on, or the luxuriant tree on which it alights, dies, decays, and withers, and then is uprooted by the monster's devastating beak. It desolates the entire countryside with its poison until it is like the Syrian deserts and sands where no plant takes root and no grass grows. Now he goes on to talk about how this uh, affects the Jewish community and it's interesting to say here that he says, I do not want to be remiss in telling you that in addition to the enemies, there were at that time some confessos, meaning like these uh, new Christians, who delivered their own brothers into this cruel monster's power, an allusion to the, the cycle of torture and forced confession and denunciation of other Jews. Poverty was the spur and the reason for most of their evil acts. Many poor confessors went to the houses of their richer brothers to ask for a loan of 50 or 100 crusados for their needs. If any refused them, they accused him of Judaizing with them. Terrible situation, and once again, with the Inquisition, um, uh, Huao III closes the borders again. This is the environment in which Usque uh, experienced his youth and young adulthood. So let us go to Usque himself. The na we don't even know if this is his real name. The only thing we really know about him are whatever information is included in this book and in a few scattered references of his contemporaries. Uh, it may be a pseudonym, because uh, he refers, he, he shares some autobiographical information. He says that his family comes from Huesca, which is a town in Castile in Spain. So it may be a, uh, an acronym meaning like the person from Huesco. It's also interesting to note that um, he seems very fond of acronyms and of uh, anagrams, you know, when you take the letters of a word and you mix them up. So for example, one of the main characters in the, uh, the constellations is uh, Ikabo, which is an acronym of Yaakov. So uh, some scholars have argued that he may be um, Manuel Gracia, if I remember correctly. Um, that's a, an acronym for a not especially well-known Christian it's a Christian name for a converso, and Usque may have been a pseudonym that he hid behind. Uh, we'll talk about what Emmanuel oh, Gomez, excuse me. We know from his own description that his family entered Portugal right after the expulsion of 1492, and he was born shortly thereafter, so he grew up in this environment of mob violence followed by the Inquisition. Uh, we know that he has, based on this text, tremendous familiarity with the broad swath of learning of 16th century thought. Uh, very similar in many ways to the figures we looked at in Al-Andalus, who had a, a very broad Jewish and non-Jewish education. We don't know exactly where he got this information, because after all, uh, he grew up as a nominal Christian, where any education uh, you know, of a Jewish character was entirely proscribed. So he learned all of his Jewish knowledge underground in Portugal. But he may have gone to the University of Coimbra because he was thoroughly familiar with Latin and Greek and with the literature of the church fathers. It's not impossible, argues Cohen, that in fact he may have been, like many um, sub rosa new Christians, he may have been studying for the priesthood because only as a student of the priesthood would he have been given access to the kind of broad humanities education that, uh, that was required to write a book like this. Um, we know from his own text that he managed to leave sometime after 1531 and he essentially embarked on a world tour, which he describes in his book. And we have some sense that he was in England throughout Central uh, Europe. He also made it to Constantinople, Salonika, and Greece, uh, all the places where Sephardic Jews had made their homes immediately after the expulsion, and in particular in the tremendous city of Tzfat, which was just then enjoying its tremendous explosion of Jewish. Jewish creativity, but where we know him best is in Ferrara, where he actually wrote this book. Ferrara was the home of Doña Gracia and Benvenida Abravanel, the subject of last week's lecture, uh, two incredibly powerful and wealthy women who used their political might and their uh, political acumen uh, 
and their considerable resources to defend Sephardic Jews worldwide through ransoming captives to engaging in geopolitical machinations such as the attempted boycott of the port of Ar Ar Antona and Ar Ancona and so on. And one of the most important things that both of them did was that they supported early scholarship in Ferrara and allowed for tremendous uh, energies to be placed into publishing. Uh, the Ferrara Bible shown here is uh, the, uh, the result of their efforts. This is exactly in the same period as uh, Usque wrote his book. And you can see in this particular image, which is written, uh, the Ferrara Bible written in Spanish, uh, for those who, who fled the Inquisition, you can see the, the, uh, this motif, very beautiful, of these terrifying gargoyle-like features that sort of remind me of the winds perhaps or they're blowing the winds and here's a ship that's clearly in distress the mast is broken and there are these sea monsters in the water and this is kind of metaphorical of the, of the Spanish Jews being exiled from their homeland going throughout the Mediterranean even crossing the Atlantic to the New World uh, with tremendous danger uh, there were three usques of note in Ferrara at this time and scholars have wondered, you know, how could it be that this is a name, which, by the way, we don't even know how he spelled it in Hebrew. We only have it in, the, um, in Portuguese and Roman letters. Uh, how is it you have three usques, not a common name, all together in the same place? Possibly because they were uh, related or possibly because they all chose the same pseudonym. Uh, Solomon, Abraham, and Samuel, uh, that's our... Um, our, our uh, protagonist today, uh, they were uh, publishers and writers together. Samuel Uske in particular may be an acronym for Manuel Gomez, but the three of them together produced the Ferrara Bible and the Consolations for the Tribulations of Israel and many other works of its kind. Now, uh, let's look at the book right now itself. What exactly is this book we're talking about? So, oh, I forgot to read you one thing here. Sorry, I wanted to read you. Don't worry, I only have four selections, and I've read two of them already. This is the uh, beautiful dedication to Doña Gracia Nasi. Publications, publishing is so dependent on material support. It doesn't happen by itself. People have to find, you know, as we say in Perkeabas, im ein kemach ein Torah. If there's no flower, there's no Torah. You have to have... You know, okay. Anyways, the dedication here is to the very illustrious lady, Doña Gracia Nasi. And so Samuel Uske writes, The heart is prized as the human body's noblest and most important organ, for it is the first to feel the pain which any other part of the body suffers. Indeed, it must be kept content for all the others to be at ease. Since my prime pur purpose is to serve our Portuguese nation. Dona Gracia was also from Portugal. She was also a converso who returned to Judaism after fleeing the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, my prime purpose is to serve our Portuguese nation with this small branch bearing new fruit. It is proper to offer it to your excellency, for you are the heart in the body of our people. In the remedies you have offered, you have always shown that you feel our people's sufferings more poignantly than anyone else. I say this not out of blind devotion, though I am your protege, most illustrious lady, and desire to satisfy you through works, writings, and deeds, and to show myself in some small way grateful for the largesse I have received from your generous hand. Since you began to reveal your light, even our sucklings have imbibed this truth at their mother's breasts, and your name and the memory of your goodness will forever be a part of the marrow of their bones, which is in fact true. We speak of Doña Gracia Mendes 500 years later with the same respect and admiration because of the decisions she made with her individual uh, powers and wealth. So you get a sense of the relationships there. Uh, he also speaks very positively of her rival, Benvenida Abravanel. Obviously, he didn't want to offend either one of them, and he benefited from both. At any rate, what is the purpose of this book? Um, it is, as I alluded to in his dedication there, that he, um, he wants to provide consolation for these scattered, embattled populations of Portuguese Jews who are not sure what to do with themselves. They're hiding their, their, their Jewish identities. They're hiding their Jewish practices. They're trying to live a life 
of, of outward Christian behavior. They're worried about what will happen to their children, what will happen to their legacy. And on a deeper level, metaphysically, they worry, has God abandoned us? Were we wrong to maintain our Jewish identity for 1,500 years that now we are suffering such tremendous pain? And so he begins in his prologue, which maybe I won't read to you, maybe I'll just paraphrase it, but it's very beautiful. He says, listen, I've written this book, which is in many ways a long scroll of agony, to quote a, the title of a Holocaust work. Uh, it's a long scroll of agony detailing the so many persecutions that we have suffered since the uh, exile actually 2,000 years ago under the Babylonians. And in each of those exiles, each of those persecutions, we have uh, endured primarily by attachment to our faith. He spends a lot of time talking about how the persecution itself is embedded in biblical texts, that you know this particular thing happened here, and you can see an allusion to it in the book of Deuteronomy. Some of those parallels are absolutely chilling. And of course, we can do the same in our own generation looking at the Holocaust, where we see the, uh, the similarities between these far-off prophecies and some of the terrible things that we experienced. But nevertheless, the fact is that if the prophecies that describe the persecution were true, then it also follows the prophecies that describe the redemption are true. It's reminiscent, if you're familiar, with the famous Talmudic passage when some rabbis are, are surveying the disaster in Jerusalem uh, during the Hadrianic persecutions of the second century. And uh, some of the rabbis are moaning and wailing, and Rabbi Akiva, the greatest, starts laughing. And they say to him, Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? Oh, the, it was a specifically occasioned because they saw a fox running through the uh, ruins of the temple. And what a terrible thing to have a fox running through the holy of holies like that. And the rabbis say to him, Akiva, how can you laugh? And he says, I'm laughing because I know that if this has happened to Jerusalem, which was foretold in our prophecies, then we will also see the redemption that is similarly foretold in our prophecies. So this book, in Portuguese, for a Portuguese remnant, is going over and over again in often painful details, the specific persecutions that Jews have endured historically and in a very long section at the end, in their own person and in their own day in the 16th century. Absolutely fascinating structure and guide. Uh, I've mentioned already the, uh, the language is Portuguese because he was speaking specifically to his generation. Uh, the style is in the form of a dialogue particularly between three shepherds. There are these two shepherds who, uh, and, well, actually, I'll tell you that in the next slide, so I'll tell you. And the message I've already told you, so let's jump ahead. There's three dialogues in it. The first one introduces the, the three characters where they, these are kind of like timeless people who live for centuries upon centuries. One of them is a shepherd named Ikabo, which is an, an, an anagram for Yaakov, which um, is not a coincidence. Usque makes that clear in his introduction that this is what he's trying to do. And he is comforted by two other shepherds, one named Numeo, for whom Usque says is representative of the prophet Nahum. The word Nahum in Hebrew means consoler, one who consoles. And the other one, Zikareo, which is the prophet Zechariah, meaning the one who remembers. Zechariah, remembering God, literally. And the first dialogue essentially has these three characters, and it really does read Shakespearean in a Shakespearean manner because they're speaking in very elevated language, and they're, you, know, you get a sense of scenery. They describe where they're sitting, what they're doing, sometimes using metaphors of the hunt and hares and ostriches and lions and things like that. And he goes through the basic uh, elements of Jewish history in the first dog up to the Babylonian exile. Now I should mention at this point, um, many scholars have kind of got lost in the weeds about this because as a historian, he's not so good. As a historian, there are lots of inaccuracies and he is heavily dependent on 
poor sources. So he can only be as good as his sources. And quite often, he's conflating dates and he's conflating events. And um, you know, he's confused about certain basic elements. But that's not what he's trying to do. He's not trying to write a history. He's trying to write a book of consolation. And the, the religious and psychological message is really what is prevalent here. The second dialogue uh, takes it from the return of the Jews in the 6th century before the Common Era right up until the Roman exile. And by the way, this is kind of an interesting piece. Uh, Dr. Stephen Fine, a scholar at uh, Yeshiva University, recently discovered tiny traces of pigment in the famous Arch of Titus uh, frieze that, um, that is in Rome. And uh, he was able to reconstruct the way it actually looked in the first century. Uh, so Romans, at the time it was built, actually saw a painted frieze that looked something like this. It was much more garish than the way that we see it today, but nevertheless, it was a very powerful thing. And if you can imagine, in a, in a, uh, in a pre-literate culture, this is an incredibly powerful, iconic reminder of the conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, at any rate, let us go on. The third dialogue is perhaps the most fascinating, and one that uh, many scholars have meditated on the most. Um, it goes from the post-Roman exile, second century basically, right up until the 16th century, including some very lengthy descriptions of things that, um, that Usque experienced himself or his immediate prior generations. So he now becomes a much more important source for a discussion of the Spanish Inquisition, the exile, the Portuguese Inquisition, and so on. Uh, and he then leaves, he flees Portugal, and we have some sense of what Jewish life was like as he wanders around these scattered Sephardic communities uh, throughout the Mediterranean basin. The autobiographical material here is very rich and dense. You get a sense of who he is as a person and the tremendous sense of mission that he brings to the task of this particular literary endeavor. Uh, he ends with a very long prophetic conclusion in which he, he wraps up all of his, his uh, thoughts about the persecution of Jews and connects it specifically to the, uh, the coming of the Messiah, though he may tarry with tremendous drama and feeling. It's hard to not be swept away with the emotion of this work. If you can imagine yourself in you know, the, the kind of conditions under which Portuguese Jews would have been reading this. Perhaps they would have been working with a painstakingly hand-copied version of it. Perhaps the head of the family would have been reading it by candlelight, quietly, in order not to uh, arouse the attention of, of neighbors. Uh, perhaps it would have been furtively studied in a, in a secret room in the house. Who knows how it was actually passed down from one generation to another, but we know that it had a phenomenal impact and it was a major feature in preserving the integrity of the Portuguese Jews in their tremendous suffering. Uh, this, by the way, is a photograph that's just trying to convey the up message at the end of it. Happens to be a photo photographer that I like a lot, Yaakov Naomi in Israel. Um, and he describes, you know, after this long book of punishments and persecution, he speaks about the ultimate redemption that uh, in many ways we enjoy aspects of it today in, with, with a free state in Israel and so on. No theological content implied there. Um, so taking it as a whole, the legacy of uh, Samuel Uske is extremely uh, important, although very rarely studied. This is, by the way, a picture from Portugal to get a sense of the, the kind of environment in which they, they lost. And it makes me wonder, you know, since we have returned many times to this parallel of the Holocaust and the Spanish Inquisition and expulsion, it makes me wonder, you know, who is writing this kind of material for us today? Where are the authors who are giving us a coherent message that helps us assimilate the horrific persecution that the Jewish people endured last century into our contemporary Weltanschauung? Is it possible? Is it perhaps outrageous to ask for such a thing? But we don't have in my humble opinion, anyone at the caliber of Usque giving us that kind of message today. Thank you very much for your attention and your endurance. Remember, no class next week, but we'll begin the week after with a lecture on the Chida, and I can hang around for a few questions.
Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I hope you enjoyed that lecture. I myself got a lot out of studying Samuel Uske's work, and it was a great privilege to be able to speak about it to uh, an audience live last night. Um, you didn't see it in the end of the video, but immediately after I concluded, I was jumped on by a whole bunch of audience members who really wanted to push me on a couple things I said at the very end of the lecture. So I thought I'll use this moment to unpack some of their questions and explain a little bit better what I mean by this. We should bear in mind that in many ways, we are in a parallel generation to Usque, that his experience 70 years after the Spanish expulsion has certain salient comparisons with the experience we have 70 years after the Holocaust. Now, I'm not going to take this 30 seconds or so that I have right now to go through all of the parallels, but there's no question that we are living in kind of like a not exactly a post-apocalyptic era, but a post-catastrophe era. And um, I think that we don't really have someone with the voice of Usque who's kind of like explaining it all for us in a way that we can grasp. Um, we have our poets of the Holocaust. We have our Elie Wiesel's. We have many people with tremendously heroic stories of suffering during the Holocaust and personal and communal redemption. I, I myself studied the Eish Kodesh uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto, who is an incredible story, an incredible thinker from the Holocaust. But what we don't have, in my humble opinion, is we don't have someone 70 years out who's able to explain to us, to the Jewish community as a whole, as to what the Holocaust means in the larger arc of Jewish history. How do we assimilate the Holocaust? Can we assimilate the Holocaust into our Weltanschau? Um, how do we deal with the contemporary crises of, you know, assimilation and the, the, the challenges to the state of Israel and all kinds of really existential challenges to our very being at, at this point in time? Um, these are, are very big questions. And I feel in many ways, like in this postmodern period, we're, we're sort of floating in space, waiting for someone to kind of explain it all to us in a way that Samuel Usque did. Okay, anyways, those are my two cents. Uh, you heard more than my two cents already for the first part of this lecture. Uh, I hope it's food for thought, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you about Jewish history in the future. Thanks very much for watching.